won't be much over. Welcome to session five. It's a um, of the financial planning introductory course. Uh, I put an agenda up on the board, so I'm going to cover specifically some additional things on time value of money. So if you have any questions on anything other than the time value of money for units one, two, and three, um, a couple people did, and I want to cover them with everybody because when I'm going to go over the ones I did receive. But if anybody else has a question, you can either text it to me right now or when we are, um, if you have microphone capability, you can feel free to answer, uh, bring it up. So one of the questions I received by email had to do with um, session, I'm sorry, in the textbook, um, page 5.35 was talked about payments for consumer debt. And the question had to be with why was that information on, uh, on page 8.0, uh, well, actually, I'm sorry. There, there were two issues here. So I'm going to the, first, the second one first. On you, page 8.55455556, it's a discussion on, in the textbook, the uh, Lamone textbook, is a discussion on leasing. And one of your colleagues wanted to know why is it divided by 24 and as opposed to 36 since it's a 36 month lease, is they were dividing it based upon the uh, factor of how long it needs to recapitalize the actual money. That's all I could figure out. Um, you're not going to get a question like that just so you know that technical on the quiz or on the midterm. Uh, but it was a good question because it's a 36 month lease, so they wanted to know why it wasn't divided, the total cost wasn't divided by 36. It had to do with um, how much they were taking out for the capitalization of the item. The other question that somebody uh, texted me had to do with uh, Unit 1, slides 79 through 81, and again referring to the textbook 5.35, there was a question on how it was determined in terms of consumer loans and housing loan and housing costs. Two separate things, consumer loan, housing costs, that's where the confusion was. Another student wanted some clarification on when you need to use uh, a Series 66, 65 as an investment advisor or an inve registered investment advisor representative. And I just want to make sure you're clear. If you're basically doing transactions, and I just dropped my notes, sorry. If you're basically doing transactions for a commission, you, have the, you don't have a fiduciary responsibility, you have a suitability responsibility. If you're doing advisory work based upon the three keys of giving advice or analysis concerning securities as a business standard for a commissions or a fee compensation, then you need to follow the investment advisor registration and I went over that in great detail. If you are just doing stocks and transactions, you're, you're on right now a suitability standard that may be changing in the future, but that's what you have to be aware of. Um, there was one other question that had to do with the calculator. Well, let me, let me review that first. There was one other question that had to do with, um, you know, sorry, the email I had with the question, I don't have any more, but I believe it had to do with not leasing but educational funding and different vehicles for funding. The textbook mentions a certain kind of CD that is indexed. I've never sold it. I've never seen it. I've talked. I've never heard about it because the student who called me said that's really a great deal. If they're going to guarantee it's going to keep pace with uh, the cost of education with no risk. There are some states that do have a reimbursement contract or plan that guarantees to, that if you pay into it, you will guarantee to have your tuition paid but uh, Illinois is not one of them. And some of the states that did guarantee that they had to actually put more money into the, uh, the funds. But I've never seen a CD that's going to guarantee to be indexed for inflation. Um, I didn't have time to look today. 
You should be completed with quizzes one, two, and three by Wednesday. One, two, and three by Wednesday. And um, quiz one, again, you have two opportunities to go through it, so you should have a perfect score on it. Quizzes two and three, you get one opportunity. Um, are there any questions anybody wants to ask me about any of the quizzes so far? Okay, I don't see anybody raising their hand or anything coming in, so I'm going to move on. If something, you remember something, let me know. Time value of money. The worksheets are due before you, the midterm, and the midterm is supposed to be available actually next, uh, after Wednesday. So get the worksheets to me and I will email you the keystrokes and the answer key. One of the, your colleagues said, I want to make sure I'm doing it right and I don't see the answers. Well, my problem is if I send you the answers in advance, I'm sort of defeating the purpose of the worksheet. I don't expect you to get all the answers correct. I don't expect you to have be perfect. It's a, it's, that's why it's not graded, it's just you're turning it in. And the reason for that is you need to practice problems. There are practice problems in the textbook, and now I put up that tutorial for how to use the calculator with more practice problems. Don't get hung up on whether you can or can't do the time value of money problems in the calculator. You're going to have 12 or 13 on the midterm. You have 10 on the quiz. You're going to have another maybe two or three on your final. And then you have to go to the next class and you're going to have some questions on your comprehensive. However, in the real world, most of what you're using this calculator for, as I said earlier, is improve you know how to do the process because in the real world computers are going to do it for you. If you're having lots of other problems with it, do contact me. I'll do my best to help you. 